James the second. Uh, James, Duke of York, becomes king uh, when Charles the second dies. And uh, we had the Rye House plot and then, and then this sort of uh, consolidation of the power of, of Charles. Uh, and then he dies at the end, ruling as an arbitrary absolute monarch. So Charles has effectively conducted uh, uh, class warfare and restored the monarchy, uh, you know, at least by some accounts, to the grandeur of the old days. Um, but of course, it's not a feudal order because they've undermined all the aspects of feudalism. So what do you know? Obviously, we're moving into a new phase. What is that supposed to to look like? So James uh, comes to the throne as the legitimate uh, heir to the throne and um, rules from 1685 to 1688. So for three years. Now, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, parliament is called so the first parliament of James is called in 1685. So he doesn't try to rule uh, without parliament. Um, but with the popularity of the monarch, we get Tory majorities, uh, royalist majorities in both houses, both the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And um, they grant James tonnage and poundage for life, just like the old tradition. Remember before Charles the first, um, in the first session of parliament after a, a monarch came to the throne, uh, it was just sort of a matter of course that parliament would <clears throat> grant to the king um, the revenues uh, from uh, customs duties uh, for the import and import of what we call tariffs uh, today, and uh, and then that could be a revenue stream for for the crown. They do that. Uh, that's very generous because, of course, that was a big sticking issue with Charles the First. They only the first Parliament under Charles only and granted it to him one year, and then they kept withholding, and then that's what ultimately led to the eleven of personal rule. Um, Part, but a big part of that. And uh, they grant James high taxes on sugar and tobacco. Okay, these are imports from the Americas. And this is like the bread and butter of the city of London. This is, you know, people are becoming addicted to sugar and tobacco at this time. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, uh, uh, and, and just think, uh, you know, back in the 17th century, just what you think of the, the people going to the pub and drinking beer and smoking their pipe and, uh, and you know, mom's at home, uh, the wife is at home with the kids cooking and baking cookies. You know, this is kind of like, uh, you know, or baking a cake. This is like very sort of, fundamental to English lifestyle and that's all just developing uh, at this time period with the trade with the Americas. So in Virginia, where they're doing the African slave trade, they're growing tobacco. I mean, that's that's one of the biggest uh, crops there. In the Spanish Hispaniola, uh, in modern day Dominican Republic and Haiti, they're growing sugarcane and exporting that all around the world, but especially into um, Europe. <clears throat> so this is a great stream of revenue for James, but it's a slight to the city of London. So the Tories have the majority. Tories are more royalist. They're less associated with the city of London. They're more uh, landed gentry, nobles who own land and they're trying to return, you know, they're trying to restore the feudalism, uh, but without the core components of feudalism. Um, 
and they're sliding the city of London, the bankers and, um, and speculators uh, and the city of London. And uh, that of course causes trouble. So there's rebellions that break out uh, in, in the same year that uh, James is crowned. Um, and these are serious rebellion. I, I mean, maybe rebellions aren't even, because uh, we think of rebellions now as kind of like populist uprising. These are, these are armies uh, that are coordinated and launched from Holland, sail across the channel, land in Scotland and England, and, um, and, and then, you know, attempt to invade the country. Uh, they are relatively small scale, but the the idea was that they would have a small uh, small contingents that would land on shore, and then they would rally the public and uh, accumulate soldiers along the way, uh, like in the way that uh, Che Guevara talked about, which happened in the Cuban Revolution. Uh, they were thinking of something along those lines. <clears throat> Um, so there's the Argyle Rising, uh, which was led by uh, the Earl of Argyle. That was his uh, his his uh, fiefdom, and um, that's in May, lasts through June, up in Scotland. But by the end of June, Argyle is executed uh, for treason, of course. Um, in the midst of June, the Monmouth Rebellion, uh, you know, uh, Duke of Monmouth uh, uh, lands in the southwest corner of England and begins to work across the country. Uh, this rebellion is a little more successful and gains more um, of popularity from the populace. The one thing Mammoth is the eldest illegitimate son of, of Charles. Uh, and this is Charles II. So when the exclusion crisis happened and uh, Shaftesbury and others introduced bills to exclude James, who is now on the throne, they all one of the alternatives proposed was to have uh, mammoth go on the throne because he's the eldest illegitimate son of of charles and um that might fly and he's a staunch protestant okay so uh but uh, but this rebellion is also put down and mammoth is executed in mid-july all oh, right now, one thing that's interesting here and, and is noted by, Char uh, by James is that the, these rebel armies were formed in the Netherlands and they coordinated with each other. So they, they time it to, to make it all work as a, a pincher move to come at, it, at, um, at England from two different directions. But this all happened under the watch of William of Orange in the Netherlands. Uh, why didn't William step in and stop things? And it, you know, it even is a little more perturbing because William is James's son-in-law. Remember that William married Mary, who is James's daughter, uh, against James's protest, but got pushed through by Danby, who then was impeached and imprisoned. Um, uh, this irks James, but William tries to, you know, uh, console him by sending troops to su suppress the Mama rebellion. And of course the rebellion was suppressed. Uh, so maybe there was some significance there uh, to cover things up, but we see a bit of tension between William and James. Now, James sends out Judge Jeffries, who is known as the hanging judge, and maybe this is where this uh, 
where this uh, phrase comes from, uh, but it's a period of the bloody assizes. So these are trials, forced labor, execution, public displays of remains um, for people suspected of colluding in these rebellions. Um, uh, large quantities of people are, are put on trial and sentenced in a very public and spectacular sort of way. Uh, and just like with Bloody Mary and the persecution there, this does not go well with the public, really. Um, Lord Delamere in, uh, in the House of Lords is tried by the House of Lords. So Lord Delamere is part of the House of Lords. He is tried for treasonous uh, involvement with the Mama Rebellion, but is acquitted okay, by a panel of jurors, of 30 jurors. Lord, uh, or uh, Judge Jeffries is part of uh, this panel and is presiding over this panel, uh, but the jurors uh, uh, just decide to acquit uh, Delamere uh, in October of 1685. And in November, right at the beginning of November, now we're now the dates start to <clears throat> start to get a little more specific because things start to uh, unfold very quickly right in this section. So this is a big turning point. Um, James gives a speech to Parliament and he announces his intent to abolish the Test Acts. That means that Catholics can now, you know. Uh, can serve in government without uh, without uh, making an oath against transubstantiation, uh, and that he intends to maintain the new army raised in opposition to the rebellion. So they had to raise an army to put down those rebellions. He's like, okay, I'm going to keep this uh, army in place. And many of the officers were hand chosen by Charles or by James because they were Catholics. So now we have a large number, a significant number of, of Catholic officers in this larger standing army. Uh, and of course, this creates a scare, a, a return to Catholicism by military force. We have the bloody assizes, uh, this Lord Delamere case. Um, there's a bill for new revenues to maintain this army and um, it's narrowly defeated. So parliament is pretty much evenly split between Tories and Whigs, but James does not get the funds that he needs to uh, continue with these, his proposed policies at this point. James prorogues parliament November 20th and then after that, he just keeps proroguing Parliament before they ever seek. He keeps on delaying uh, the time, the date set for their their next meeting. He doesn't dissolve Parliament. He just keeps on pushing up, pushing it off uh, for over a year. And then finally, in July of 1687, he dissolves uh, this uh, the loyal Parliament. Now. The loyal parliament is called the loyal parliament because they were so generous to him in that first session uh, of the parliament. And because they were so generous with giving him uh, the tonnage and poundage duties and, and giving him the sugar and tobacco uh, taxes, uh, he's able to maintain this, this now Catholic infused larger standing army. And um, uh, and after maintaining uh, control for uh, a couple of years, he gives the Declaration of Indulgence. Now this is a very ambiguous uh, sort of sort of uh, proclamation regarding religious freedom uh, 
from the perspective of the the Whigs and um, the Anglicans uh, in England, it's seen as a very negative thing. But from almost every other perspective, it, it, it is a genuine act of religious tolerance. So he suspends the penalties for nonconformity. So he actually puts through no fines if you don't show up to church. Um, that that frees people up to actually attend their own religious ceremony on the day that they want, that they have free uh, on Sunday. Uh, he abolishes oaths for the position of government. So you don't have to take an oath denying the transubstantiation, which helps Catholics, but also helps Quakers, right? Um, now, this is deeply opposed by the Anglicans, uh, including most of the Tories. So the Tories were in favor of monarchy, but they weren't in favor of Catholicism. They're in favor, Tories were in favor of making a monarchy on the feudal model that is supported by the Anglican church. And now uh, James is trying to separate off the Church of England from the monarchy. Um, so the Anglicans are very upset, but the Puritans, Presbyterians, Quakers, et cetera, et cetera, there's a lot of these factions are all greatly benefited by this. This is actually a, a huge turn in religious freedom for non-Anglicans of any stripe. But um, <clears throat> this is highly destabilizing because now you can have open vociferous Catholics in parliament. You can have open vociferous Puritans in parliament. Uh, and maybe people that were keeping quiet before that are already you know, uh, in a political position. Um, so it's kind of a shuffling of the deck. <clears throat> and, and of course, James's strongest support was from the Tories. And now he's, you know, put a thumb in their eye. So good from the perspective of a lot of people, but for the Tories bad, and, but the Tories are James's key source of support. And, and he's already pissed off City of London, right? So City of London with the sugar and, and tobacco taxes, they're not happy with him, very powerful. Uh, the Tories was his biggest political support. He's now alienated them. Uh, and this sets the stage uh, for um, the sort of final segment of our story, which is when England establishes parliamentary uh, monarchy. And, and this is the form of government that lasts until today. Okay. So I'm going to stop the video here, and then I'll cover uh, parliamentary uh, monarchy uh, in the next video.